All the churches, and this is not only referring to Christianity, but for example in Hinduism, you have so many sects. In Islam, you have four major sects, while others. Amongst the Buddhists, you have the Hinayan and the Mahayan, etc. sects. Right. And the thing that has gone wrong with all these organized religions is that they had to bring dogmatism. So the difference between the Mormons and the Anglicans, for example, is one because of this dogmatism that was created. Now, the religion, the word means to bind back. To bind back to what? To the divinity that is within your soul, to that Christ consciousness, or Krishna consciousness, or Buddha consciousness, that is forever existing and forever eternal. So, when dogmatism wants you to have a certain dogma, one another has another dogma, what happens is that they fight. One would say, I am right, and the other would say, no, I am right. But they forget what the rightness is all about. Because the emphasis there is not on rightness, the emphasis is on the I, or my, my church, or my religion, or my this, or my that. So, if the emphasis could be shifted to rightness and the basic truths that underlie all religions, if they are studied and assimilated, then all these problems will disappear. If someone asks me, are you Christian? I say yes. If someone asks me, are you Buddhist? I say yes. If someone asks me, are you Hindu? I say yes. Because I am, of all, having understood the basis of all religions. And what is essentially the basis of all religions? It's but one. Love as I neighbor as thyself. Become one with your father. I am my father one. Do unto others which you would not expect to be done unto yourself. And that, those are certain basic principles underlying every religion. There's not a single religion that would say, hate thy neighbor. There's not a single religion that would deny to that love is God and God is love. So, when we stick to the basic principles of which we are composed, then you could say, I belong to every religion and yet no religion. Then you become a universalist like our emblem which portrays all the major religions and yet mounted on the five lines of harmony. It points out what's them. But did there be who's harmony amongst all? For one purpose is to lead us to the light within the kingdom of heaven. So what we have to do in order to find divinity is to go beyond dogma. As the old saying goes, if you want to reach London, there are, I'm sure, half a dozen roads that would take you to London. So any path one chooses, one has no right to force it upon anyone. Because the religion ought to be bound back has nothing to do with whichever path you want to take. Sometimes a person says, I'm an atheist. That atheism of his is also valid. And someone might deny the atheists, agnostics or what have you, would deny the existence of God. That is also true. Because is God not just a belief and based on a belief system? Have you seen God? 
and experienced God? So what right have you to say that there is a God? So everything as far as any religions can be justified and in the same token can be denied. So what are we trying to do is for every human being, every person to experience the divinity within themselves. And we don't want a conceptual God. You'd find uh, some religions would say that oh, he's sitting up there in the clouds with four arms. Another would say on a throne with a long beard. And, and a couple of dozen clerks noting down, oh, George did that, <laughs> and John did this, so Jean did this, Joan did this. There is no such thing. Because did God make man, or did man make God? Now, when we say God made man, it would mean that we are constituted of that divine essence and therefore we are a manifestation of that which, that indescribable that which is manifest. But then when we say that man made God, it would mean that we have belief in a conceptual God something which is conceived by our minds or our ancestors saying that God looks like this or he looks like that or he looks four arms or fine. So, so to find divinity, to repeat again, one has to transcend and go beyond darkness. Now here's another point to be remembered very well that all the opposites are true. And science has proved that. There is truth in all the opposites, but the beauty of it lies in combining that which is seemingly opposite to each other into a oneness, a wholeness, and that is the true realization that man was trying at. These religions, with the various factions, they argue and argue and argue. And yet both of them say that God is omnipresent, present everywhere. And does that not contradict that my God is right and your God is wrong, whatever my religion is right? But if he is present everywhere, then he's present in your religion as well as mine or the third mass. So, religions, as Swami Vivekanand has said, that the religions have caused, there's nothing in the world as religions that has caused more harm in the world, and there's nothing else that has done more good in the world. What has happened if we study history? What has happened in the name of religion? Hmm? For example, in Islam, they ruled with a sword. Hmm? It is even said, according to my studies of the Quran, that if you can convert a person into Islam with a point of a sword, you will go to heaven. Hmm? The conceptual heaven, of course. And none of them have come back to tell us about it. Look at the Crusaders. How many millions of people were killed in the name of religion? Look at Hinduism, Brahmanism that ruined the entirety of India with the promulgation of the caste system and all these various things that went on in the name of God just to preserve their own supremacy. Who ruled India, not the kings of the various states, but the Brahmins of priests. They rule the kings, and they told the kings how to rule their kingdom. Look at Egypt, the pharaoh gods, the pharaoh priests. So throughout history, we have found that 
going on and on and on, and yet man has not learned the lesson. But do not deny anyone else's religion. You are entitled to your belief. But remember, it's a belief. We want to proceed through meditation and spiritual practices. We want to proceed from belief to faith to knowingness. And when you reach the stage of knowingness, then you just know. Then you are going beyond the mind because belief is centered within thought forces and not in experience. So, divinity has to be experienced. And when you experience divinity, then you become a living God. And that's what we want in the world, uh, not a conceptual God, uh, but a living God. Hmm? One day at a talk somewhere, I thought I could not <coughs> traveling and talking so much. Um, this young man got up and asked a question in a rapid fire session. He says, uh, Guruji, can you show me God? I said, yes. Say you are sitting. He had a yellow uh, jersey on. I said, yes, he is sitting with a yellow jersey. Because everything is divine. And if I can't see that divinity within you, then how can you practice the living God? How can you really love your neighbor as your soul? To do unto others as you expect me, etc., etc. Okay. So the way it would be this, is first to find divinity within oneself. And that we achieve by going to the deeper and deeper level of our souls until we reach the kingdom of heaven within. And by recognizing the divinity within our souls, we recognize the we recognize very automatically and spontaneously the divinity everything around us, even the worm that crawls on the floor. Because the life force that is in the worm is the same life force that is within me. So the only difference between that worm and me is but the worm, though having a consciousness, he is not evolved to my level of consciousness. That's the only difference. And in due process of evolution, that worm will also reach the stage of my consciousness. So these various theologies talk consciousness. Consciousness could never be complete if it is put in a narrow groove. Consciousness is never complete until it is limited to the conscious mind only. Through spiritual practices, we reach a vaster and vaster consciousness which would embrace the entire universe. We could sit down and become just one with that which is. You reach the stage of is, yes, I am that I am. You reach that stage of is, yes, where you feel at one minute with the entire universe, and that is the atonement all religions talk about. Atonement at one minute. So, we love all, be it Mormon or Anglican or Catholic, so much. That person has that level of understanding that keeps him there. And he will later on grow out of it. You write a child grows into a young man, the young man grows into the old man, but he's still the same person. Changes have taken place. 
And in the spiritual terms, we call that evolving or evolution to greater and greater levels of our being. And when we find our being, we find automatically that that being is just that. Therefore, when theologists say that there is only one God, it is very true, but they do not realize the significance of it. I remember uh, about three, four years ago, I gave a press conference in London, and this is one thing I pointed out, that all these people that go to theological colleges, they must, while they're studying the various religions and their religion and what have you, they must be put through a, a, a real strong, regular process of meditation. Because what the churches lack today is that these ministers, not having realized themselves or found some depth within themselves, uh, they become bats. From the creative sermons, you know, from the big book. Uh, this happens in every religion. So, because being barrets, they can impart no spiritual force. Now, once our ministers and pastors and then start or have the spiritual force, then the people in, the, in their congregations would experience that spiritual force. Because if you have no spirituality, how could you impart spirituality? If I have no uh, few shillings in my pocket, how can I give it to another? So one has to acquire it first. And that is the problem with religions. So the one, the Mormons would say, this is the truth, and the other would say, that is the truth. And saying that, it leads one to the biggest untruth. But there is one factor to be remembered. I'm not denying any theology. I'm not denying any religion, therefore I call myself of all religions. But the important factor to remember there is that they must stop being dogmatic. Open mind, that is what is needed. Theologies and religions have done a lot of good to this world. For even if you believe or have faith in something which is erroneous, that too, because of your own thought forces, you can make it to come pass. If you believe in a heaven uh, of any description, and, and you have that faith, and your thought forces are powerful enough, so when you leave this body, that's exactly what you are going to find. Yes. So heavens or hells, two are of your own making. For example, the Islamic religion say that uh, if you live a good life here uh, and don't harm anyone and you don't drink wine and this, that and the other, when you pass away, you will go to heaven and there you will find young damsels called Hawaris, uh, you know, they will be serving you and looking after you, and there will be uh, rivers of wine flowing. You can't have it here. <laughs> so you got to wait until it is here. Now, is that practicing the living God? You know, this fellow goes up to heaven, to the pearly gates, and uh, the St. Peter was there, and of course everything is computerized now. <laughs> so uh, sitting at the gate with the computer, so this chap goes up and uh, to heaven and says, what's your name? 
my name is George Jones. So they press the buttons there and uh, St. Peter says, I'm sorry, uh, can't find your name on the list. Uh, perhaps you belong to the other side of the other place. That was a hot one. <laughs> right, so, um, so this chap says, uh, <clears throat> Look, St. Peter, I've lived such a good life. I've never harmed anyone. I've always been loving to my fellow man and this, that. There must be something wrong. So then you know, St. Peter went to the larger computer and said, let me check again. So he checked and he found George Jones's name. So he says, yes, I found your name, but you were not due here for three years. But by the way, who was your doctor? <laughs> So many of the religions have become nothing but business institutions. And therefore, they need uh, uh, this organization, institutionalizing things. In the beginning, uh, originally they used to teach of love. But when they couldn't keep people it was the idea of love that they brought out fear, eternal damnation. There's no such thing. There's only one eternity, and that eternity is divinity. And how can you damn divinity? <laughs> right. So, a lot of things have been for monetary gains, especially. Because if your congregation has got many people, they're not going to make a living. Hmm? So, for monastery gain, a lot of things were introduced in the name of all the religions of the world, which are not true. Hmm? Religion means, as I said before, to bind back, to bind back to your true self, your real self, and not the false imagined unreal soul that people did. So I would uh, not take much notice of that. I'd rather say to myself, let me find myself full. Don't, don't all the scriptures say, man, know thyself. Can we be? Theology says that, and that's how you find divinity. Hmm? Because that divinity is so. Uh, I used to say before, over and over again, that the job of the external guru is to awaken the internal guru within you, then you become your own guru. But I left out the punchline. But now I think I can tell you. Hmm? There's a balance. Stage by stage. And you've got to do it. Hmm? Otherwise, you won't enjoy it or it might become unpalatable. Hmm? So the job of the external guru is to lead you to your internal guru and then you become a guru unto yourself. But remember that when you become a guru unto yourself, no separation exists between you and the external guru, for you become one. You realize that one is. You see the peace of it. Same thing applies with everything in life. Once you realize that divinity is in you, you become one with divinity. Because the problem in the world today is this uh, diversity. <clears throat> and uh, man has to, for his own sake, for his own happiness, for his own equilibrium and peace, he has to find university, uh, unity in diversity. Now, for example, on the 19th of November, 
one of my programs in America is to be the main speaker at the World Parliament of Religions, where uh, all the religions of the world uh, will be speaking, you know, trying to form the basis of this. Uh, that conference was the one, uh, I think it was in 1893, where Swami Vivekananda attended. And I believe I was told it's going to be in the same hall and uh, I'm going to get the same seat, <laughs> reserving the same one which Swami Vivekananda sat on. So I wish uh, your strength to make it really successful and make them realize that all religions are one. Do not follow dogma, only have an open mind and find the oneness, the unity in diversity. Although, of course, diversity adds to the spice of life. But still, enjoy the diversity, but know the binding thoughts. Even from this very moment onward, uh, even before you realize it, before it's assimilated, uh, that although I see things all around me to be separated, I know the underlying force is but one. And that force, though being one, and because of manifestation and mixture of various atomic and subatomic qualities, seem diverse, mm -hmm. but that diversity is just made up of name and form. It's name and form. It is like gold. Uh, you can make uh, rings out of it and you can make bracelets or a necklace. And then if you see, you say that's a ring. And then if you see the bracelet, you say that's a bracelet or a, a necklace, a necklace. But what is it really? Gold. Yes. So, as soon as we shift our attention from name and form, you find that this world could become a better place. When you yourself could become a better person by realizing that the freezing is a part just by the surroundings. Mm -hmm. As manifestation, we could be called God's children. But when we change the highest rung to the manifester, then you can say, I am that God. And no separation could ever exist. It had never existed. Yes. Only I was deluded in thinking that the things were separate. But now I've gone beyond the delusion. And I know and experience my primal soul, which was without separation. Please. So these are the things that religions have to take care of, all religions. Uh, the two, I was saying to some people at dinner the other day, as the two most wealthiest organizations in the world is the church and insurance companies. The church promises you, you know, in heaven after you're dead, and the insurance company promises you a lump sum of money after you're dead. <laughs> so, in other words, what is happening? They function on man's individuality, is that it? Yeah. Do If you tell me sugar is sweet, I say thank you, friend, for telling me sugar is sweet, because I know you won't guide me wrong. I believe you. But I want to try out that sugar to see if it's sweet or not. And when I feel the sweetness of it, then I say, yes, I know. <laughs> thank you, friend. You started me off on the belief system. That sugar eats me, and that's the only thing religions can do around the world. They can start in geology. But you have to progress to a higher stage of happiness. But you find 
clothes he wants and the ones he calls. That's the stage of realization. And then in this stuff, uh, 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 you become the heart. And that's in the heart. And we get up to the light of that. I know what kind of jays you like. I know what you say. You know, this young man who uh, applied for a job as a buyer at Marks and Spencer because he went to see the personal manager for a job. The, the personal manager was showing him around with the buying department and he said, he says now, remember our slogan. You either buy good or good buy. Look at him with this man. Oh, it's wicked again with the same one. <laughs> you know, he went to Piccadilly Circus and he was trying to find a parking space and he traveled around and up and down the streets and couldn't find parking. So in desperation, he parked the place where you're not supposed to park. And so he wrote the uh, notes there, there. And he said, forgive me, dear traffic policeman, forgive me for my trespasses. So a few minutes later, the traffic policeman comes on there. Uh, and the traffic policeman wrote a note like, look, my sergeant in chief is going to come around here in five minutes, so lead me not into temptation. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear something colorful like, uh, the editor got an invitation from a nudist colony. And uh, so the other story of this could make his news because they're always looking for sensations. So he sends one of his reporters. He's a good to the news party and uh, bring a report. Yeah. So this pretty young reporter went there to the news party. Next morning he comes back and to face the editor. So the editor asks him what happened. He says, oh, sir. Everyone was uh, in the birth of these suits. Everyone was new. Uh, even the butler was new. So the editor asked, how do you know he was the butler? Well, sir, he sure wasn't the maid. <laughs> Churchill. Uh, went out one night. Churchill went out one night and uh, he came home late. So the next morning, Mrs. Churchill uh, tells him, uh, now asks him, Where were you? So he says, uh, I was at the Grand Hotel. Meanwhile, that afternoon, Mrs. Churchill went shopping. She met Mrs. Ackley, and Churchill and Ackley had gone out together. So uh, Mrs. Ashley told him was it too happy doing. So she comes home and says, she says, Winston, you know, you've been telling me a lie. Because I was just speaking to Mrs. Ashley and she says that you were not at the Grand Hotel. So Church replies, he says, well, uh, I was in such a state last night that I could not pronounce the doctor there. <laughs> and because this chap into the pub, uh, and by profession he was uh, uh, a cannonball. The main circuses you have pushing a guy in a cannon, shoot him out. So the afternoon he had a performance, and so he found a mate in the pub the next day. I'm trying to learn English. He found a mate the next day in the pub, and they were chatting. So he says, What do you do? He says, Well, I'm a human cannonball. And I've got a program on this afternoon. That's why I came here to the pub to get loaded.
and we'll get a discovery of marriage. And they decided they were thinking. But right. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he was chatting to a friend, and the friend uh, says, you know, this is really funny. I don't know why you sleep in separate bedrooms. What happens, he asked the friend, you know, what happens if you feel like a cuddle? So he says, oh, that's very easy. I just whistle, and my wife comes. So the friend says, wait a minute. Now look at, let us look at the other way around. What happens if your wife feels for a cuddle? Then what do you do? Oh, that's very easy. She comes to my door and knocks and says, Is it? Did you whistle? This bishop is walking around the gardens of his monastery. And uh, there's a monk busy working in the garden, and uh, the bishop says, the monk could hear what the bishop was saying. He said, oh, look at God's beautiful work in the flowers and the trees. So he said, oh, look, look at God's beautiful work. So the monk looks up to the bishop and says, sir, you should have seen it when he had it alone. <laughs> Of course, the moral of the story is this, that God only helps those that helps themselves. Fine. So, of course, it's our incumbent duty to help ourselves by following the path best suited to us, and yet have an open mind that there are other paths that are also best suited to other people. Okay. And to remember the idea that what are we all striving to do? We're striving to find happiness and peace. And the only way to find total happiness and peace is to reach deep within ourselves.